In the end, Europe did turn out to vote. Voters rattling the form, not always as predicted. The highest participation in an EU election for 25 years, pushing the two mainstream center-right and center-left blocks below 50% of the vote. That's a first. They're still the top two vote-getters across the continent. But the momentum's definitely with either those who want a lot more Europe or those who want a lot less. With Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin at times gunning for the EU and its institutions, it's all about who now calls the shots in Brussels. And picking new European commissioners and a new boss of the European Central Bank, well, it's also about the EU's next seven-year budget, deciding on security, immigration, energy transition. How does the higher turnout impact domestic policy among the 28? Already, Greece's prime minister has had to call a snap election. What about France, Germany, Spain, Italy, and the UK, which wasn't even supposed to vote, turn out higher there, with a result, alas, that uh, leaves that bitter divide over Brexit more than ever unresolved. More broadly, does a more energized EU mean a more polarized EU? Today in the France 24 debate, we're wondering whose Europe it will be going forward with us. John Henley, who's the European affairs correspondent for a British newspaper, The Guardian. How are you, sir? Hi, I'm good. Thank you. Uh, also joining us, Jean Messiaud, national delegate for Marine Le Pen's National Rally Party. Hi, how are you doing? Welcome to the show. Thank you. Welcome to former Italian member of parliament, Sandro Gozzi, a candidate for Emmanuel Macron's list here yes. in France, Renaissance. Exactly. I say candidate because you're... Elected if? If uh, Brexit happens by the 31st of, of October. So, so I'm one of the five frozen, uh, frozen uh, MEP. <laughs> so you're rooting for Brexit? <laughs> I, I was already rooting for Brexit before. Now I got, of course, a vested interest. But I thought that uh, the best way to respect the democratic decision now is that the UK goes. Then, in the future, they might decide to rejoin. That would be the best way to respect the democratic will of the people. All right, we'll revisit that point. Uh, the uh, France 24 debate on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag F24 debate. On Sunday, it, it may have seemed like 28 national races. Now it's Monday, and it's all about building a majority. The EPP losing 41 seats, the Social Democrats 45 seats, the Liberal Democrats... Uh, would surge, uh, that's the group that's the, in purple there, Aldi, uh, and would surge thanks to Macron's uh, 21 seats. The Greens are on plus 19. And uh, uh, you see there that uh, it's a very different, a more fragmented uh, EU parliament. There's going to be an informal EU summit on Tuesday in Brussels. And already the horse trading uh, has begun. Were you surprised by these results, John Henley? No, they were pretty largely signalled. I think the surprise, uh, the, 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 the only real surprise was the scale of the, of the Greens' advance. Uh, pretty much everything else was was in the kind of within the kind of margins of errors of of most of the national polling companies, and what it means, as you said, uh, you know, is that the the two main centre right centre left blocks, uh, which represent parties, the big you know, conservative and social democrat parties that have traditionally governed Europe, most of Europe pretty much since the end of the Second World War. As you said, they've lost their majority. They're going to have to look for new coalitions and new majorities. And that's likely to really bring the, uh, the Liberals into play and probably also the Greens. Uh, so it's going to be coalition building. Uh, we're not, um, in France, we're not good at this kind of exercise. Is it going to be like Germany where... Uh, they're going to first decide what the platform is before they, they agree on uh, who gets to be in it? Well, it's, it's clearly a matter of politics and not of numbers. And it's a matter of uh, refounding a new majority that we want to refound about around our political priorities for Europe and not enlarging a majority which has failed. Uh, because after all, the two big losers of these elections are the Social Democrats and the EPP. And there is a new, uh, a new element, a new group in town that the, the group we are going to uh, create, which is going to be decisive for any new majority. But we want to start from a commitment on policy priorities, Tra ecological transition, fight against inequalities, rule of law. These are the political priorities around which we are going to negotiate with the groups which share a pro-European agenda. Is there a path, Jean Messia, for... Um for the likes of uh, your group, uh, Matteo Salvini, etc., to 
to build a coalition? Yeah, let, let me just uh, comment on your scheme you show on TV a minute ago about, you know, this uh, um, Europe, new Europe, European Parliament. Uh, I think you, you are plated the, the reality of the vote to the existing group, uh, while what is happening right now is just negotiations to create new groups. So it's, it's not possible to understand the new reality of the European Parliament through the existing group who are going, to, which are going to disappear, uh, many of them in the next coming days. So this do not show exactly uh, what will happen. So there is change right now. Yeah, there is change. We we have um, initiated negotiations with uh, all our allies. Uh, I don't think, for example, when you say that uh, Viktor Orbán uh, in Hungary will not be ours, etc. Because uh, yeah, right nothing, now, just to explain to our viewers, true. Orbán sits with the EPP, the main center right bloc. You'd like him to to move over to you? Yes, of course. I don't. I don't think that uh, the 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 PPE will keep uh, Viktor Orbán because I agree with what uh, what's been said minutes ago. It's it's about politics, not about numbers. Today, uh, the, in the European Parliament, we are talking about 170 MPs, sovereignist MPs, who can vote. 170. In the, hang on. Yeah, who are who, who who can vote the same way. It's not about an organic view, it's about a political view. And even more, if you add uh, the far left, which also have a, a, a composition of sovereignists and which can vote with us on some uh, issues that concern European sovereignty. So uh, the Eurosceptical in the new European Parliament constitute like second or third uh, group in the, in the Parliament. Of course, this cannot be seen throughout uh, the ventilation of the groups, but by the votes, you can understand that the Eurosceptical are very important in the new uh, uh, European Parliament. Let, let, let's, call, let's call yeah, up, I, that, let's call up that, that, that graph again, John Henley. You agree? I think you're absolutely right that there are potentially 170 uh, MEPs in the new parliament that want, broadly speaking, less EU mm. as opposed to more EU. Um, that's still um, a minority. Uh, you know, you're talking, this is a 750... Between a quarter and a third. This is a 150, this is 750 seat parliament. Yeah. You're talking 170 MEPs. But and I think what's also, let me, hang on, I think what's also very important is that those groups disagree on a very large number of things. Apart, they agree on less EU, but they disagree on some very fundamental policy issues. There's a big divide between the sort of Le Pen, Salvini camp and the Eastern European Eurosceptics, for example, on their attitude to Vladimir Putin in Russia, whether yes. or not they're pro-Kremlin. There's a big divide on attitudes to migration. Salvini, who we see there, uh, you know, is very keen to have quotas for migrants to, to, to divide, distribute them evenly around, around Europe. Uh, Viktor Orban, that's the last thing he wants. There's a big divide too on economic policy. Salvini, Marine Le Pen uh, are very much kind of what they want to bust open EU budgets. Uh, they want to increase state spending. The, the Nordic Eurosceptics, the far right parties of Denmark and, and Sweden and Finland, that's the last thing they want. So there's a lot that these parties yeah. disagree on. Le Whether or not they can actually construct a coherent block is a, a really you know, difficult question. Let me precise that. You, you are right. But the new thing in the, in the new European Parliament after this election is that the two main parties that govern Europe through the past 25 years have not now an absolute majority that could allow them to govern Europe the way they govern it this past 20 years. And this is a big revolution. I so and, and you are talking about the European Parliament. It's not a national parliament, the European Parliament, as you know, is a consensual uh, assembly. So you must have the agreement of all the groups. So it, this agreement will be much more difficult to find uh, where, with uh, 170 the MPs than uh, before. This is the first, uh, the first thing I want to, to quote. The other thing is that we are talking about strategical issues, the strategical issues regarding, for example, the migration, regarding the unloyal uh, commercial competition with the other part of the world. All these strategic issues, I think, I guess, we could have an agreement with all the groups. Of course, you cannot understand this new European Parliament with the federal software 
that is applying yeah. to Europe till now because we are building, uh, you know, a national Europe, the Europe, Europe for nations that exist in the 60s and the 70s, a Europe of cooperation be between okay. sovereign states. So yeah. we, we, uh, we want to, at this point in time, welcome uh, from Brussels, uh, Monica Frasson, the co-chair of the European Greens, uh, to our discussion. Thank you for being with us here in, in the France 24 debate. Uh, f first of all, listening to the, to the conversation now, how different is it going to be for, in Brussels from now on? Well, I think that uh, I must admit that I'm not very sure it's going to be very different unless there is uh, an acceptance that things have, have really to change politically and also under a uh, methodological point of view, if you want. What I mean here is that there must be a, um, a consciousness that uh, uh, those who had the majority till now or very often had the majority at European level, both at national but also at the, at the level of the European Parliament and the European Commission, um, must change at least part of their uh, own policies in order to be able uh, to answer to the willingness of people to change, whether it is by voting green and also uh, whether it is by voting parties that uh, um, are certainly not uh, in favor or um, are not in favor of a greater European integration. So I think that in, unless there is uh, this, not this acceptance that things have to radically change, um, I believe that uh, it's going to be indeed more difficult, but also not much more positive. And I also think that uh, the question of, the, of climate change is going much beyond a green issue. And I think that that is also behind the uh, victory in uh, some member states of the Greens. All right. Uh, of course, it's going to be uh, interesting to see uh, the discussion over whether or not on different issues, different blocks will vote different ways. What's certain is that the first battle that's going to come up is uh, that for European Commission president, perhaps the most powerful job mm -hmm. on the strength of sheer numbers, the uh, European People's Party, the center-right bloc, throwing a victory bash in Brussels on Sunday and positioning their leader, Manfred Weber, from the German Bavarian CSU party, to replace Jean-Claude Juncker uh, as the top person at the commission. Uh, the head of uh, the EPP in, in Parliament, Joseph Dahl, saying, we've won the elections, we ask for only one post, the presidency of the European Commission. Well, for her part, the outgoing EU competition commissioner, uh, Margaret Vestager, throwing an olive branch to the leader of the Social Democrats, she too is gunning for the top job. I have worked with uh, breaking monopolies. This is basically what I've been doing for five years by now. <laughs> and uh, this is also what Lotus have been doing today. The monopoly of power is broken. And this is, of course, why we can do something else. And I very much appreciated what my colleague Franz Timmermann just said, that a coalition can be built of those who want to do something. Sandra Gozi, how far will um, the, your bloc, the Renaissance bloc, go in defending Vestager's candidacy? Will they go to the point where Emmanuel Macron has to cross swords with the Germans? I, I can tell you where we, we won't go any far in supporting Manfred Weber. Manfred Weber will never be president of the commission. Never? Never be president <clears throat> of the commission because uh, EPP has, has lost the election. They have lost almost 40 seats. Uh, they got a tiny relative majority. And Manfred Weber is not able at all to build up that large majority in the European Parliament that the new president of the Commission must, must uh, build. So I think that uh, it is, uh, for Manfred Weber is a non-start. And we have to see which uh, women or men are able to gain a large support in the European Parliament, because it is clear that we need a large majority. The nationalists, it's true that they, they, got, they, are, they, are, they are in a minority, almost 30 percent, but we must build up a new political majority. And certainly Manfred Weber is not able to do that. And it has been, it has been too ambiguous. And certainly we don't intend to have agreement with the European People's Party, with Viktor Orban in. On, on, also on this issue, Manfred Weber has been too ambiguous. So we, we put uh, Manfred but if Weber aside. But if, hang on, but if there's horse trading here, and the Germans say to the French, I'll tell you what, we'll support a French candidate for president of the European Central Bank. You let Weber come in. This is the horse trading which has kept Europe in the status quo for too long. 
Uh, it is and are you sure it Macron won't impossible. blink? Are you sure Macron for me, won't... for me, it is inconceivable to think of a renewal, a, a, a European renewal, with uh, this kind of austerity, and notably with someone like Manfred Weber, president of the European Commission. So uh, I don't think I, I, I'm, I'm sure that he will never get uh, our support. It's most likely, I think, to be someone who isn't even in the running at the moment, because historically, uh, the president of the Commission is basically the person who the lowest number of countries dislike. OK, and that, uh, rather than one of the front runners who comes in and is really pushed by one of the big member states, very often, you know, consensus forms around a candidate that is kind of more or less acceptable to everybody. Uh, and that might well mean it's somebody who... So you know, it's not Margaret Vestager. Who knows? I mean, I think, I think there's a very high possibility to be someone who we haven't even heard mentioned this far. Monica Frassoni, who would you like to see get the top job? You see, I think that uh, the horse trading, as uh, my friend uh, Sandro Gozzi just uh, said, is exactly what we don't have to do now. I believe that uh, the situation, we have uh, two main priorities. One is to take out uh, fundamentally the decision about the president of the commission from the exclusive hands of the head of states of government. And this is the main reason why we have the leading candidate process. And second is to make sure that we have the best possible candidate for the uh, European Commission president, which is able to implement the best program. And this is what we are not really clear about in this moment. Because if we are only talking about names, we are not really talking about the kind mm. of European Parliament majority we want to build. And personally, and also under, under a political point of view, Greens have won this election, or have a good result of this election, to do very concrete things. And frankly, uh, except our two leading candidates, we are not very sure that any of the others will be able to, um, to implement these proposals before we talk with them. So there is no uh, veto, uh, differently from what uh, um, my friend Sandro just said, uh, but because we are ready to talk, but because we, are, we really want to put at the center this issue of climate change and new jobs and everything. And in this very moment, we are not sure that we share this uh, urgency with anybody. And mind you, I am not saying this because I want to escape from the, from the issue of who will be the favorite and who will be the name that we want. But it's a real uh, political positioning from the part but, of the Greens. Let's see the card on the table. Let's see on our right. main yeah. issues but what the, the, uh, are the, the proposals. Exactly what I was and we are ready to talk with everybody. <laughs> All right, but we'll, this, this is exactly what I was saying. We'll, we'll, we don't stand for names. We stand for political priorities. The there is another winner. Though, uh, and the winner, another winner is our least renaissance, who so is going to create a new group. We want to start from the policy priorities, not from the names. Certainly, we don't want to start from the name of Manfred Weber. <laughs> OK, that much is clear. We'll be right back. Stay with us. You're watching the France 24 debate. Welcome back, or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France 24 debate, and uh, we're... Uh, digesting unprecedented results from uh, European elections, European elections that saw, by the way, the highest turnout in a quarter century. We're talking about it, about these, uh, this energized vote with John Henley, who's the European affairs correspondent for The Guardian. Jean Messia, who is national delegate uh, for uh, Marine Le Pen's national rally party. Uh, Sandro Gozzi, candidate for the Renaissance list, an Italian who's running here in France. How European? <laughs> and very, uh, European and transnational, and like, right. like politics should be in a European democracy. And Mo Monica Frassoni <laughs> joins us uh, from Brussels, co-chair uh, of the Greens. Uh, speaking of Italy, Matteo Salvini uh, crushing the competition at home with 34% of the vote. Italy's deputy prime minister positioning himself, well, as the leader of the far right in Europe. Not only is the League the first party in Italy, but also Marine Le Pen is the first party in France. Nigel Farage is the first party in the UK. Therefore, Italy, France, the UK, it is a sign of a Europe that is changing. A sign that Europe is changing. But again, we look at the results, uh, Jean Messia, and we see more votes uh, for uh, like-minded people like you. But at the same time, we're also seeing more votes for those who want more Europe. 
Yes, you know, we entered a, a dynamic. It's a process. Uh, you cannot understand it, but a spontaneous generation from one day to the other. I mean, look at what happened in, two, in 2017 when Marine Le Pen accessed to the second uh, tour of uh, the presidential election. We have this uh, wave of uh, patriotic and nationalist uh, uh, groups arriving into power, not only in Europe, but also in the world. Look at what happened in the United States with Trump. Look what happened in Brazil with Bo Bolsonaro but haven't you, haven't in you, India, and ha even in Europe. So haven't you plateaued a little bit? Um, I mean, let's look at the French results here. Yeah. Uh, Emmanuel Macron uh, made finishings first his party's goal. That didn't happen. Exactly. And uh, Marine Le Pen's party, though, if you look, losing in terms of share of the vote over to, when you compare with 2014, and they even lose two seats if the UK stays in the EU. They'll finish on uh, even on 23 seats with Renaissance should Brexit happen. So, yes, your party finishes tops, but also there's the question of, uh, and we, we can see it here, uh, the number of votes. Have you filled up as many votes as you can get? Can you go? Yes. Can you get more at this if point you, in time? It doesn't you look, seem you, that you are you are asking the percentage, but if you look at the number of votes. If you look at uh, how many voters vote for, voted for us in 2014, the last uh, European election, and the numbers who voted for us in this election, we are almost 600,000 uh, more voters in 2019 for the election, for, uh, European election than 2014. So, uh, and also there is a, quali a qualitative change because in 2014 there was no La République en marche, there was no Macron, you, as you know. But where are when, you going to get more votes? That's the question. When you look at the numbers from, from Sunday Listen, night. Uh, one year ago, every uh, uh, spectator and uh, uh, journalist would bury us and say, national rally is dead, Marine Le Pen after the presidential election is not politic politically alive anymore. And as we see in 2019, we are still the first party to arrive but is in a national uh, ballot. So, you know, just put the, th the things in the context of the two uh, past years. You, you cannot analyze like this in the absolute. And there is the leader, is the natural leader for uh, Europe's far right, Marine Le Pen, or is it uh, Matteo Salvini? Matteo Salvini is in power in Italy. You know, he is governing. He's a vice prime minister of Italy. And, and the second time, he is also uh, away from us in the votes for Europe. So he is a natural leader, of course, but number two is Marine Le Pen. And as Matteo Salvini said in, in your report, you have also uh, Nigel Farage. You know, Nigel Farage, it was a f uh, when uh, two years ago, Emmanuel Macron was talking, f he, 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 he drove a fake news because he said, you know, Nigel Farage just voted for the Brexit and he flew. Uh, once the Brexit was voted, he, you know, flew like a thief and he don't want, doesn't want to, uh, to talk about, uh, the, about Brexit again. And on the other hand, they talk that uh, the British people say if the referendum is to be put again today, majority of the British people will vote against the Brexit. And you know now that all this was fake news. Nigel Farage is still here. Uh, the British people still majority in favour of, of the Brexit. True. That's absolutely not it, true. Exactly British what people the, are not majority yeah, in favour yeah, of Brexit. Yeah. I'm sorry, there, uh, these how, election how, results... These how, elections do, how do you explain that but, the, the, the Nigel Farage party arrived at, at, at least two... He gathered almost two uh, times the number of voters than, than the, 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 the Labour Party... Uh, because the Labour Party is not anti-Brexit. Even, even the Conservatives. No, listen, listen, listen. Yeah. The other way of looking at it, this, at that, this is that the Nigel Farage's Brexit party simply took all the votes of UKIP, his former party, the pro the explicitly pro and remain part of the conservative parties. parties the explicitly pro, pro remain parties right so that's the liberal democrats change the new pro remain party the snp the welsh the greens between them collected almost exactly the same number of votes as the pro brexit brexit party the two central parties the conservatives and the labor party both suffered because of their ambiguity on Brexit, essentially. The voters who voted for Brexit 
didn't feel that they could vote for the Conservative Party because it mm. wasn't delivering it. And voters who voted Can... to remain couldn't vote for the Labour Party because they didn't think that the Labour Party actually supported Remain. Can we agree on the fact that British people decided to Brexit? They, in by, 2016. Yes, by 37% of the British electorate voted to leave. E exactly the same percentage of Maastricht in 1992. And nobody, and nobody is asking to revote Maastricht but, but again. Why, why, when it is uh, against Europe, you ask for revote? And the, when it is in favour of Europe, you say, you applaud and you say, OK, this is the majority of people voted. No, I'm just there saying... There is a problem no, no, here. No, 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 all I'm saying is that the British electorate is still almost precisely split. Yeah, yeah, but a, as the French electorate also. But nobody contests when uh, the vote well, is in favour of Europe. Nobody well, this contests is the, it. This is the question, isn't it? That in the UK, turnout was 35%. Not huge, but it was up on mm -hmm. what it was yeah. in 2014. Mm -hmm. If you add the number of seats, I'm looking now at numbers of seats here, um, you'll see that 37 Remainers to 33 Brexiters yeah. have been elected. Yeah. It's a swing of 10 you, you, seats. It is, it is, it is but, intellectually dishonest to claim that this election result in Britain is a vote for a hard Brexit. But, it, but, it's no, but, no, it's, no, but it is, but Brexit, you agree that Brexit. it is inconclusive. And it's been three years and yeah, it's still inconclusive. Uh, it, it was obvious and it was a bad decision. Mm. When Theresa May said, give me by 3rd of June, we should have given by the 3rd of June. Mm. Donald Tusk and Angela Merkel made a huge mistake and Manuel Macron was right because they want to give to UK even one year. They want to, to remain in this uncertainty until March 2020. And it was only thanks to the action of Mac Macron we decided by the 31st October. Why it is a mistake? It's a huge political mistake because we cannot allow the anti-European forces say, hey, you don't respect the democratic will of the people when you don't like the result. And this is exactly mm. what Europe has been doing in the mm. past. So I do believe that UK Brexit must happen, must happen by the 31st October. As pro-European, the friend of UK, I hope that in the future there will be a majority who will ask after the general election to rejoin. That would be the way of respecting the democratic will of the people, not to bring, not to keep UK in this limbo, in this uncertainty for three years. And after three years, nothing has changed because it is, the, the UK is deeply divided. But Majority needs only one one vote more. He's very motivated to become European Parliament. Huh? Mo Monica, <laughs> Monica, that is sure. But I was saying this before. Ma I Monica, was saying this before. Monica Frassoni, do you agree? Well, I actually see that the main problem of Brexit is uh, in the UK and notably in the Conservative and in the Labour. And that is something that has to be very clearly stated because also Labour Party is extremely responsible for the situation in mm. which we are in. And uh, the, the point is that the pro-European parties uh, are extremely clear on what they want and this is something that has to be somehow respected. But I also believe that uh, we should not uh, allow um, this Brexit undecis undecisiveness to get uh, to uh, weaken the European Union as such. So I believe that there must be a decision by the 31st of October. But differently from uh, Sandro Gozzi, I believe that the possibility of having a second referendum is something that should be kept in, uh, but, in the yeah, landscape. Yeah, but there won't be. Uh, because <laughs> I, I, even I, jo Monica, Monica that... even Jeremy Corbyn today mm. has said that there won't be a second referendum before the 31st of October. I, so this idea of waiting for Godot, yes, I, it is I, I bad exactly for Europe what, because I do believe that we, no, no, we no, no, need no, to no. think not, about what we have to sorry, do I, to reform Europe, not what we have to do to uh, get out Westminster from the limbo where Westminster has put itself. That's the problem. So it is clear that I, if that's, there was a clear exactly, will to having exactly, a second referendum sorry, but I didn't to remain, you, Sandro, I would be the first one speaking. to be happy. <laughs> <laughs> right, Monica, Monica Frassoni. <laughs> I am not, I'm sorry, but I did not interrupt you when you were speaking, so thank you for not interrupting me. So what I am saying simply is that indeed we should not linger on and on and on and on, but we also have to take into account that the fact for the UK to get out is just without any kind of agreement is not good for the UK and is not good for us. Right. And I believe that the question of the second referendum, whatever Jeremy Corbyn says, will have to come back on the agenda if the there is no agreement for the 31st of October. So that is the only thing I'm saying, and I think that the pro-European 
front um, is also very strong in the UK and also has to be respected. Having said that, we cannot go on much longer for the simple reason that this is getting also at the stability and of the, uh, on the capacity of reforming of the European Union. J just one final point on this, because it goes beyond just Brexit. I guess the, the, the verb of the day after last night's vote is equivocate. Uh, the, 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 the people on the left in, in the UK are fuming mad at Jeremy Corbyn for... Mm, Sitting on the fence. Sitting on the fence. He's sat on the fence on Brexit. If Labour had, is, is if Labour a, had come out as an is actively, there a bigger... explicitly pro-Remain party... Right. Uh, it would have been right up there. In, the, the way Brexit. politics is done, I, the way I, politics I, I is done even... across the, the EU in 2019, the lesson here is that uh, you have to be clear in your message. You, you have to, uh, you absolutely. You More than before. For, yes, you have to stand up for, for yeah, for, for what you believe in and, and not try and triangulate, basically. You mustn't, you can't try and keep everybody happy. All right. Uh, let's talk about Spain for a second. The socialists there are scoring a win, converting the try from last month's a snap general election, garnering nearly a third of the vote, while the conservatives there lost ground. Now, though, with the election of two high-profile Catalan separatists, the exiled uh, Carlos Prigdemont, the jailed Oriol Junqueras, is Brussels about to be drawn into a fight? With these votes, we will send a political prisoner, Oriol Junqueras, to the heart of Europe and we will push back the Spanish state's repression. I can tell Oriel Junqueras, Brussels and the European Parliament are waiting for you. Are, are, are you waiting for Oriel Junqueras? <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. And uh, I'm, I'm relieved that uh, after all, they didn't get this uh, huge result that they were expecting. And there are two good news from Spain. The first is that, uh, I mean, uh, the pro-European uh, Socialist Party got a very good result. The second, that Ciudadanos, which is a pro-European forces, has also increased by, I think, six or seven the, the seats compared to the last European elections. And I think that they are, these are very two very good news which come So should come he take up Spain. his seat? Should Oriol Junqueras be allowed to sit in the European Parliament? I, 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 it, is not, it is not to me to, to go into, I mean, I don't have an explicit position to say uh, about this. I only think that uh, what uh, the message which comes from Spain is positive beyond the Catalan issue, and the Catalan issue must be solved by Spaniards in Spain, not by Europe talking about Spain. I think there's one other interesting point to make in Spain, um, which is the way, which is also a pattern that we've seen across Europe in recent elections, uh, which is that parties of the centre right, uh, which try to co-opt or outflank parties of the far right, are being heavily punished at the polls. Right. We, we, that we've seen that very clearly in Spain. Uh, we've seen it in the way that Salvini completely swallowed Forza Italia. Yeah. Uh, we've seen it in the way that the national rally has completely destroyed. Uh, well, Macron, I mean, it was Macron's initiative, but, but, but the national rally has eaten, uh, you know, the, the Les Républicains vote mm -hmm. in France. It's a, it's a, it's a pattern. If you, uh, and, and Jean-Marie Le Pen, Marine's father, said, said it first and best. Uh, he, he said, why would you vote for the copy when you can vote for the original? Um, yeah. And that's a pattern that is very clear across Europe and was very clear again in Spain yesterday. This is, uh, you know, the, re the recomposition of the European political scene uh, we are witnessing for now two or three years. Uh, before, we have the right party and the left party. Those are the parties who govern the nations of Europe and also, of course, Europe itself through the European institutions. Uh, two years ago, there is a, a changement in the uh, model that govern the nations and that govern Europe. We have now the comeback of the frontiers, the comeback of the identities, the comeback for the political voluntarist, uh, voluntarism. All, the, all those uh, um, uh, features mm. are now in power in many countries throughout the world and even in Europe. So, as I said, we are witnessing a process. It's a dynamic. Of course, it is not from one day to another that all Europe will change. But it is exactly what happened in, back in the 80s, back in the 80s when we were at that time, in the early 80s, when we were, you know, in a state-driven world and we changed to a market-free 
uh, model uh, with Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan and all this new model take place uh, in the world. It arrives also in 10 years, you know. Uh, today we are assisting, we are initiating a new model, this page of free market, no border, uh, uh, free um, movement of people throughout the world is now closing in many countries and people are asking for protections, are asking for borders. That does not mean we ask for close ourselves and, live, they and asking, live in autarky. Are, they're also asking for more of a European identity. When you see the Austrian far right got punished uh, because of its uh, party leaders trying to uh, curry favors from what he thought was a Kremlin insider in that sting video, sting operation video. You know, do you say to yourself that maybe also this vote is bad news for both Trump and Putin? I think th this, will, this will not change uh, the fact uh, of uh, the, the, the political movement we are uh, uh, witnessing today. This is Piccadilly, you know, it's uh, uh, concerning the political local life of Austria. By the way, I'm asking, I'm answering also to your question. I do not believe there is a European democracy. Uh, as, I know you don't. As such, because, <laughs> no, be, because you don't. there is no European people. Of course. Uh, we are, you of are course. Italian, there is, there is, I am French. Yeah, uh, there, are, there are only more than 400 is, 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 million is, is people who just citizen. voted for European Parliament, so, but there is no people so and no democracy. There is, no, there is, there is no democracy in Europe because there is no European people. European people is, you, you, read, you write that in plural. We are French people, Italian people, doesn't German change, people. Doesn't change anything you, for you democracy. You cannot melt. All yeah, those identities absolutely. and create but you see, a fictive you see, you see the fact European that we people. don't want to melt anybody. Yeah, you, but this these, is your but project. These, the, these, feder the European federalism is this. For a European this. democracy, you don't need one single people. And you yes. need to merge people. Yes. You can have different people no. that exercise their right to vote no. a European Parliament, which is unique in the world. No. But of course, you want to dissolve the European Parliament. I ask your, you party, your party has been elected, question. but you would just like to suppress the European okay. Parliament. I, I, so, I mean, the point is that uh, you are saying this uh, just the day after there has been an increase in the turnout of the European voters, and we have lived a very good exercise of your democ okay. European democracy. Allow you me know just, what is the problem? No, no, let me finish and then at least. Yeah, but the not problem is not demos. The, the problem is Kratos. The problem is not that we don't have the peoples with an S. The problem is that we should give more power to Europe to handle no, the, to provide security. You give to power to a technocracy that no, will never. No, I let, let me bring in. Let me bring in. Just be a democracy. Let me bring in. Let me bring in, let me can, bring in no, Monica. I can only ask, ask you one question. Let me bring if in Monica Frasoni. If the European Frasoni. model was a good yeah. idea, why does this model did not? Been imitated in it, the rest of the world. It is only you are always democracy. comparing it, it, Europe it to, the other, to the to the I, rest I, of the I world. Except you? for this, can I answer to you? It yeah. is imitated. Where only? Well, there Where is a, there is a free market in North America? Where? No, 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 no. There is a free market I'm asking in about the European institutions. There are there are, there the are, there are, there are, there are institutions in, in in the African Union. You know the difference between us and the other form of, 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 of regional cooperation, that they do not have a democracy. We have a democracy. And they don't have a European, the European parliament. European we have a parliament. They don't, the they don't democracy. elect their, their representative. We Let me bring in the European this democracy is, the is killing the mm. national democracy. This is the big difference. All right. it's a Ma Monica Frassoni, um, here we are at a time when uh, we have the superpowers uh, who are battling, the US and China over trade, most notably. These elections, do they bolster Europe's standing? Well, it depends on the majority that will govern Europe. I believe that uh, um, the, the issue here is that uh, the so-called new model that uh, the gentleman was talking about is not new at all. It was uh, actually, uh, let's say, uh, set up uh, already in the 30s and with nationalism, with the frontiers, with peoples, with identity, and the result was war. That is the result of, the, of the bringing that logic to the end. And I think that what we have to do now is to answer to the worry of the people and to s make sure that those who are afraid of their future, because they have the right to be protected, are presented with fundamentally different politics, that policies mm. that go in the direction of changing, indeed, the uh, situation by confronting certain challenges like uh, climate change, the redistribution, the tax policies, etc. But all of this can only be done with a strong and democratic Europe. Right, so we'll, under we'll, that 
point of view, they, there is no solution. There is no solution in new frontiers, but there can be things that are done differently from today. And let right. me just say one single Very word, briefly, we're out word of time. concerning the extreme right parties. In this moment, yes, most of those parties, even the Lega who won today the elections, are confronted with very heavy issues of bad spending, of corruption, of very strange, you know, um, behaviors under the point of view of managing mm. of the power, which have to do with giving Europe in the hands of China and Russia. Mm -hmm. And this is another reason why we should make sure that both nationally and at European level we have a completely different majority. For sure, the but governing we parties were very competent uh, budgetary and monetary right. rules in the past 40 years. Jean Messia, I want to thank you. I want to thank as well Monica Frassoni for being with us uh, from Brussels. John Henley. Sandro Godzi. Thank Stay you. with us. Media Watch is next. And we say hello to James Creedon. Hi, Francois. So much to say on this. Uh, not enough time, I guess, to cover all of the different angles uh, across all of the European um, newspapers around. Uh, around all of the, the themes emerging. EU vote confirms French far right as Macron's main opposition. I suppose that's one of the main points of uh, observation uh, emerging from. Uh, but also the strong showing of the Green Party even here in France uh, mm. with 13%. And what they're saying here is that the strong showing of uh, the, uh, of, the, of the far right isn't necessarily going to change Emmanuel Macron's direction in, in terms of policy, but actually the strong, strong showing of the Green Party could in fact uh, force Emmanuel Macron's government to take into account the extent to which uh, environmental issues are at the heart of uh, the electorate's uh, concern. Uh, this is at least analysis in, uh, uh, from Angelique Chrysafis uh, in The Guardian. Uh, she says Macron's high-profile environment minister quit in fury last year, saying the president was not doing enough on the climate issue. The large turnout of young voters for the Green Party could push the government to step up its domestic response on the climate emergency. That's an analysis coming back uh, in other uh, articles too. This in the Daily Beast. Young voters out to save the world might just save Europe from the populist uh, uh, madness. And uh, so that is, I suppose, one theme that is certainly coming through European elections. Green Party surge as Green Wave hits the EU. Um, also, uh, the, the fact that the traditional left-wing and right-wing parties have been in collapse mode, that's not a new trend, but certainly was confirmed in these European elections. Christophe Guilly here uh, speaking also to The Guardian, saying the traditional uh, left-right divide is giving way to one that reflects a fundamental class conflict that will define the West in the 21st century. The working class, classes whose livelihoods have been hollowed out by globalization, pitted against those socio-economic groups who have benefited from it. Other uh, points of analysis... Uh, uh, this one from Le Monde, talking about how uh, the focus on, uh, I suppose, issues that create anxiety, such as the, mi the migration crisis, actually kind of uh, took the focus away from two main issues uh, in uh, that are affecting European, uh, European voters. The intra-European exodus, countries that have seen, for example, Italy, mm. uh, Spain, where you have this, these, from countries like Romania as well, migrating towards Germany and the UK. Going where the jobs are. Right, exactly. So con countries, 12% uh, uh, of Bulgarians, 7% of, of, of Polish population have left to work in another European country. And these are issues that weren't really present uh, much uh, in the discussion, which tended to follow um, it, you know, the, 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 the populist versus pro-European integration sort of uh, axes of debate, if you like. Um, this is a, a map in Le Monde showing as well, as I was saying, the collapse of the... the uh, of the traditional parties. Red is where uh, the party has hemorrhaged results uh, or votes since the last This is the uh, Socialist election. Party. That's the Socialist Party. You can Which see... Which finished on, what, 6 point something percent? 6.3%. And for the Conservative Gosh. Les Républicains, it was 8.4%. And you can see that's their map of quote-unquote hemorrhaging. It just so happens that red is the colour they chose for, um, <laughs> for the loss of votes. And you can see then other parties, green... Uh, indicating uh, that the other end of the spectrum where, par where parties, uh, La France Insoumise, uh, doing a little bit stronger there as well. But certainly that is a clear theme coming through that was also reflected in the UK. I'll just finish with this. The Liberal Democrats have won more seats in the European Parliament than Labour and the Conservative Party put together. Mm -hmm. Anyone who would have predicted this a year ago would have been laughed off Twitter. All right, James Creedon, many thanks. I want to thank our panel once again. Thank you for joining us here in the France 24 debate.